Without him, there will be no Celine, no Ralph Simmons, and no Virgil Abloh. You might recognize his famous painter jeans or his bulletproof vest. You may have heard the name thrown around by fashion people to describe a minimalistic collection or groundbreaking design. Or you may have no idea who he is. But if you know a fashion style that's black and white, sharp, a bit androgynous, a bit sexy, and a bit industrial, you have witnessed his enduring influence in fashion. But who was really Helmut Lang? How did his designs revolutionize fashion in the 90s? And what caused one of the most revered brands at the time to crash and burn in the early 2000s? When I listen to what he's saying, when he's, there's not a suggestion that this will be his last show. Stay until the end to find out what went wrong. Welcome, Welcome to Lagazette, like your source for fashion, beauty, and Parisian lifestyle on YouTube. No olvides que tenemos subtítulos en español. Y nous vous rappelons que nous avons également des sous-titres en français. Let's dive into the story of the mysterious Helmut Lang. He was born in rural Austria and after his parents' divorce and the death of his mother, he was sent to live with his grandparents in Ramsau am Dachstein, a municipality with a population of less than 300. Fun fact about his time there, he used to live in an attic and to his adult age, he always preferred the top of the building, like the penthouse in Noho he called home in New York decades after. His father remarried and he moved to Vienna at age 10 to join the new family. He has stated in interviews he hated this period of his life. During his adolescence, his mother-in-law forced him to wear suits every day. Maybe that's where his creativity for clothing stems from, as in the age when most people normally get to experiment with style, he was forced to conform to a uniform. At 18, he left his house and got into art school. Once he was free to wear whatever he wanted, he experimented with many styles in a short amount of time and decided he wasn't pleased with what was available for him to wear. He started creating clothes for himself. And then, as his entourage in the art scene of Vienna liked his look, he started selling them made-to-measure pieces. In 1977, he hired a couple of seamstresses and opened a made-to-measure studio. He didn't have a formal fashion education, so his approach to clothes making was naive. He said he just asked things like, why don't we sew the pocket here instead of there? This gave his clothes a unique twist. In 1979, the studio became a shop, and years after, in 1986, he was invited to show in Paris for the very first time. At last, Helmut Lang, the bona fide fashion designer, was born. Right from the start, during his Paris period, he established a reputation as an avant-garde creator. With his use of unusual materials such as metallic pants, a rubber dress or a heat-sensitive cloth that change colors when in contact with skin. The artist in him liked to experiment. His clothes were the perfect answer for those rebel punks of the previous decades who were growing up and needed a new way to carry their style into adulthood. His style clashed with what was the status quo of fashion at the time. It was the opposite of the maximalism of the 80s, the opposite of Christian Lacroix and Giorgio Armani. His work was thus regarded as anti-fashion. To top it all, his arrival coincided with the 1990 recession, which meant people were ripe for a more discreet form of luxury. Anna Winter said in an interview, Helmut came along and at first it was, wait a moment, what is this? This is not the spirit of the mid 80s, which was all about opulence. And then everything crashed and fashion reflected that and Helmut was there to take advantage. He spent more than 10 years in Paris, but it wasn't until he moved to New York that he not only reached his full potential, but also gained a cult-like following. The year was 1997 and he arrived with a bang. You may not know this, but at the time, the New York shows were held in November, long after Paris Fashion Week had ended. This was too late for the Austrian designer, who decided, without consulting anyone or asking for permission, that he was going to show six weeks before the rest of the New Yorkers, the week before London Fashion Week. Calvin Klein followed him to this new date, then Donna Karan did. And that's how the current fashion month we know was created. The same year, 
1997, Lang led another revolution, on the denim front this time with the launch of his jeans line. Before then, jeans had never been considered as luxury or designer garments. But Helmut Lang elevated them, he improved their cut and added decorative touches that may seem commonplace today, but at the time were groundbreaking. His most famous jeans were the painter jeans, which were meant to imitate the look of an artist's jeans after he'd been working on his art. The innovation also took place in the materials, as he developed a rubber paint that meant the drops stayed in place even after washing. He later used it to create his tape jeans. Another feature of his jeans that went on to be imitated everywhere were the biker knees. Today, you can find the cut anywhere from Baudin to H&M. Since his days in Vienna, Lang got a lot of his inspiration from military uniforms. As a result, there often seemed to be a functional aspect to his clothes. Sometimes only as a decoration, like the use of harnesses, sometimes as actual features, like the straps that allowed his famous astro parkas to be worn as backpacks. Along with jeans and parkas, Helmut appropriated as his staples other seemingly ordinary garments, giving them a twist and thus elevating them into desirable fashion pieces, such as the notorious nipple tank top and the controversial bulletproof vest. This last one likely inspired the, this look from the Spring 2017 Yeezy collection, as Kanye West is known to be one of the biggest Helmut Lang fans out there. Innovation from Helmut came not only from the clothes he presented, but also to the presentations themselves. For stars, he didn't call them runway shows, for him they were séances de travail, which means for work sessions in French. His model casting featured, of course, the top faces of the time, like Kate Moss and Naomi, but there were also unexpected choices like his photographer friend, Elfie Simoran, who, at the time of her first show, was 51 years old. Today, casting all your cool friends for your runway show is common, and we see it at Alessandro Michele's Gucci and then Navasalia's Balenciaga. But at the time, diversity in age and body type was unheard of for a fashion show. As if that were not enough, Helmut became the first designer to present his collection online. A week before his Fall Winter 98 show, he decided to cancel it and post instead pictures of the clothes to his website. Fashion editors were sent to see the rooms with the visuals. By the way, if you're enjoying learning about this chapter in fashion history, please remember to give this video the thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more great fashion content. Okay, back to Mr. Lang. The year is 2000. Helmut is on top of the fashion world. He has been nominated by the CFDA for its three most important awards. Men's Wear, Women's Wear and Accessories Designer of the Year. This was the first time a single designer was nominated for all three. The ceremony arrived with great expectations, as it would mean for many a chance to catch a glimpse of the elusive designer. However, they were disappointed, because in a move that was categorized by Anna Winter as a mistake, he didn't show up to the ceremony. At the time his name was announced as winner of the category of menswear designer of the year, he was in his studio a few blocks away working on his new collection. About this incident, Helmut Lang said this in an interview for The New Yorker. In Europe, they still respect the privacy of the artist. Here, when you have success, it's like you belong to the public. And besides, we all know that certain awards they give you because it's politics. But anyway, it doesn't matter because I do want to play the game and help the industry. This revealing quote shows two things. No matter how influential, he always saw himself as an outsider. And even as he was making clothes, he saw himself as an artist. With a growing business, corporate interest arrived. And in 1999, in what many saw as an unexpected move, the Prada Group acquired 51% of the Helmut Lang company. Right away, they set out to develop a perfume, handbags and other accessories, a strategy that had worked wonders for other brands of the group. However, they decided to cut back the denim line, which represented most of the brand's revenues at the time. This meant a 60% loss in sales within a year. In 2004, the Prada Group purchased the rest of the company. And a year later, Helmut Lang 
left the brand. Throughout his years as a designer, Helmut Lang never left behind the art world, and he constantly collaborated with artists for his collections. One of his most famous collaborations was the campaign for the designer's first fragrance in 2000, Eau de Parfum. His friend, Jenny Hoser, created an ad where the bottle wasn't featured, and there wasn't even a model. His campaigns often featured past work of photographers where obviously there weren't any of his clothes at all. Most famous, perhaps, is the use of this 1975 self-portrait by Robo Maplethorpe or this 1979 picture for the campaign of Helmut Lang jeans. Finally, his boutiques often served as galleries and featured the work of artists that were close to the designer, like this Louis Bourgeois sculpture in the window of Lang's Paris boutique. She was also featured in a campaign of the brand photographed by Bruce Weber. With strong ties to the art world and the past as an aspiring artist in Vienna, it's only natural that, after fashion, Helmut Lang became a sculptural artist. In 2010, five years after he left his brand and, as fate would have it, a few days after he'd sorted his collection and sent many of the most important pieces to museums around the world, his archives were destroyed in a fire on his Soho studio. The artist saw this as an opportunity to create an out of the 6,000 incinerated pieces, he made sculptures. The artworks were presented in 2011 in an exhibition entitled Make It Hard, and in an interview, Lang described the pieces as 25 years of work, pigment and resin. Last year, he revisited this technique in a collaboration entitled Helmut Lang by Anthony Baccarello for Saint Laurent Reitquat. This time, instead of 25 years of his work, he used the archives of Baccarello's work for Yves Saint Laurent. The resulting sculptures were shown in the Saint Honoré boutique of the brand last October, and this year they will travel to the Los Angeles boutique to be sold. But what happened to his brand, you may wonder? Well, no longer after he left it, Prada sold it to Japanese group Link Theory Holdings, who still owns it now. After Lang, the design couple Michael and Nicole Kolobos took over the creative direction, with the likely mandate of sticking to the Lang DNA in a commercial way. They left the company in 2014. Then, in 2017, the brand tried a new creative approach, naming editor-in-chief of magazine Days and Confused Isabella Burley editor-in-residence of the brand. Finally, since 2019, creative director Thomas Cosson is at the helm and he has been tasked with reviving the rebellious, minimalistic and wearable DNA of the legendary Helmut Lang. We believe this is next to impossible task, because the brand Helmut Lang is not only the product of a man, but also of his time and his influences. Helmut Lang, the designer, didn't care about magazines or shows. He simply solved for many the problem he once had himself, what to wear every day. Along with Margiela, Lang is one of the most influential designers of the second half of the century. His versions of elevated basics still inspire what we see on runways nowadays and are the predecessors of today's streetwear. He changed the couture dresses for the jeans and t-shirts, and the world loved it. His utilitarian, minimalistic, unisex and military-inspired aesthetic was so copied at the time, it defined the whole decade and the influence of his work can be felt every season to this day. If you're still watching our video, it must mean you really enjoyed it, so please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And while you're down there, subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss our next videos. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram and TikTok for more fashion. Thanks for watching, see you soon!